So today, Tom, good to see you. Today we, uh, today's session three in our, in our series on the feast days of the church. Uh, and we, you know, uh, as you know, there's, there's really, there's 12 feast days, but then that doesn't include Easter, Pascha, which is sort of a, we, I would call it sort of a super feast day. Uh, and those, we've talked about this before, the birth of the Virgin Mary, which we covered last week. Um, the entrance of the Theotokos into the temple, which we're going to cover today. Um, the Annunciation, the Dormition of the Virgin Mary. Um, and then there's seven of the feasts that are, uh, that are, are, are Vespotiki, meaning they're, they're feasts of Christ versus feasts of the Virgin Mary. Um, and those are the Exaltation of the Cross, which we covered last week. Christmas, which we'll cover today, God willing. Um, Theophany, the baptism of our Lord, the meeting of our Lord in the temple when he was presented as a 40-day-old infant. Um, Palm Sunday, the ascension, and then uh, a Pentecost, and then the transfiguration. So um, we're going to just cover these sort of in chronological order, starting from, the, I think we've said before that the, the church's calendar year starts on September 1st. So I'm just starting at September 1st and kind of moving forward from there. Um, so, um, and this was something I read last week, but I, or whatever, three weeks ago, but I'll read it again. Um, through the calendar of feasts that is, it, it has established, the church wants to show Christians that they should not see their lives in terms of political, historical, and social events, at least not primarily, but in the light of saving events as expressed in the feasts of the Lord and of the Mother of God, as well as in the feasts of the saints. Uh, we, therefore, define the seasons of the year, autumn, winter, spring, and summer, as well as uh, partic uh, particular months through the church's wonderful calendar, which the fathers of the church drew up with divine illumination. So I, I, there was a funny story that, that I heard. I, I think it was, uh, I think it was a presbytero that posted it on, like, Facebook, and my wife saw it, and that was that they were, they were talking, it, it was like Easter had just ended, or Easter, Easter had just happened, and uh, like two, two like kids of a priest were having a conversation, and and one of them said, you know, um, you know something about like, well now the fast is over, blah blah blah. And the other one said, yeah, but we got to fast again in like three more weeks. So yeah, so it's like the whole there's this whole cycle, and it is. It really, I mean, there is a cycle. I mean, I even in my own life, I, I you know, I, I often, especially like after like big feast periods where you're just kind of, you you're, you know that you can't, you know, you're not eating this, this, and that. And like invariably the week after Easter, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be like, you know, putting cream cheese on, well, not, I don't do this anymore now because they do it themselves, but I would be putting cream cheese on like my son's, you know, uh, bagel or something and I'd get it on my hand and I'd be like, can I eat this or not, right? So, you know, and we don't want to be legalistic, but it's, you know, it's part of the rhythm of our lives. So, you know, and that's, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, so, um, the church calendar starts on September 1st. We've covered the first two feasts of the year. Last, um, the last session, which was three weeks ago, we talked about the birth of the Virgin Mary and the exaltation of the cross. So today we're going to cover the next sort of two chronological feast days, which are the presentation of the Virgin Mary into the temple and uh, the feast of, of Christmas. So that's what we're going to, God willing, cover today. Um, so, well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Um, it's always good to get a little quiz. So, what? What? Any? What? Does anyone know anything about the entrance of the Virgin Mary in, into the temple? Like, what? What is it? Like, what? Do, what are we commemorating? What? What do you know about it? Nico, you can't answer. Sorry. <laughs> I don't let my kids answer either. So, well, what is it? Anyone? Anything? Well, she was like three when. You, you know, okay, she was indeed three. Yeah, yeah. In fact. The story says that, that her dad actually wanted to take her when she was two because they had promised her they couldn't have kids, Joachim and Anna, and uh, by a miracle they, they became pregnant and they uh, vowed to dedicate their daughter to, to the temple. Um, and when she was two, Joachim wanted to take her, but then Anna said, you know what, let's wait one more year so she's a little more mature. So she was three. What, and what else? I, I gave you some of the answers already, actually. Any, anything else? You guys know? All right. Well... You'll learn more than I guess. She was the only female of it. <clears throat> well, we'll talk about that. Okay. So, so this festival, so this is a, this is a little background. 
uh, before we dive into the story itself. So this festival, like that of the Nativity of the Mother of God and the conception of the Mother of God and even the Dormition of the Mother of God, is created, uh, uh, fashioned out of the living tradition of the church, the living memory of the church. It is not recorded in the Holy Scripture. So the feasts that are listed there, none of those are in uh, you know, the Bible as we know it. They're not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, or any of the other books in the Bible. Um, it's not found in the Bible, but what we do have is an early document, certainly, uh, certainly scholars claim not later than the second century, uh, an apocryphal work called the Proto-Evangelion of James. So we talked about this, whatever, three weeks ago and maybe four weeks ago too, and that's that most of the feasts of the Virgin Mary are taken from this other book. And, and I guess it, it's good to pause for a second and just to reflect, and I, I've said this before, is that's that, that that really isn't like, for someone who's like a diehard, you know, sola scriptura, Bible-thumping Protestant, that would seem just unacceptable. Um, but what, what we would say is that, and, I, and I've said this before, is that the church existed before the Bible. Right? It existed for quite a while before the Bible. But, I mean, Christ ascended into heaven, let's say, 33 AD. Um, the, the, all of the books of the New Testament, there's 27 books in the New Testament, all of those weren't even finished being written until around the year 100. So you got 67 years right there, right, from 33 when Christ ascended to 100. You got about 67 years where there, there couldn't possibly have been a New Testament because all the books weren't even written. Um, but what, what did exist was basically the oral tradition of the church and just spoken word. I mean, basically, and there were letters, and there were lots of letters. There's more, more letters than just the New Testament that we have. There were letters from Clement, and there was, you know, all these different letters that were going around. So what we would say, I guess, is that the, the church existed before the Scripture. And so I guess we could also say that, that the Scripture is sort of subservient to the church, Right? The, church, the church is the primary authority because it came first and it established the New Testament. It decided what books were going to be in the New Testament. So this shouldn't scandalize us, I guess, is my point. This should not, if we have an orthodox mindset, this should be no problem. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so the story itself. So actually we're going to do a little bit of reading because it's easier to do it that way. Hopefully we have enough copies here. Um, Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Um, they take a daughter and, uh, to the temple. I assume it was a synagogue. Actually, she's got Jewish. Okay. Is that like a Jewish tradition? Yeah, there was. So there was a. There were. There were like sort of young girls. So. I think I think I passed enough. Hopefully, there should be some for uh, Doctor Nassif and Philip as well. Um, and you guys have Jonathan and Jesse, you have copies, right? Okay. So there, so uh, there are a couple points to that. There, there really was not a practice of sort of consecrated virginity in the Old Testament. Like people didn't, like, like we have monasticism where people don't get married and they just stay there with their whole life. That really was sort of not, that didn't make sense to a Jew because a Jew, before the coming of Christ, a Jew sort of continued to exist through his or her progeny. Which is why not having kids was such a curse. Because if you didn't have kids, like Joachim and Anna, they, you know, they were considered to be cursed. Abraham and Sarah, all these people that you know, couldn't, Zacharias and Elizabeth, right? All these different kind of biblical, historical figures. Um, but what would happen is sometimes, the, yes, they would take a, a young girl and sort of put her in the temple for a period of time. Now, the Virgin Mary was put in the Holy of Holies, which was totally unheard of. Because only one, only the high priest would go there once a year to offer a sacrifice. So that was a little bit different, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but yeah, I don't, does that answer your question? Okay. Let's read. So this is just the backstory, real quick. I'm just going to read through it. Um, hopefully the font is big enough for you, because it's barely big enough for me. Um, when the Most Holy Virgin Mary reached the age of three, her holy parents, Joachim and Anna, took her from Nazareth, to Jerusalem to get dedicate her to the service of God according to their earlier promise. It was a three-day journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem, but traveling to do a God-pleasing work, this journey was not difficult for them. Many kinsmen of Joachim and Anna gathered in Jerusalem to take part in this event, at which the invisible angels of God were also present. 
leading the procession into the temple were virgins with lighted tapers, that's like a candle, uh, in their hands. Then the Most Holy Virgin, led on one side by her father and on the other side by her mother. <clears throat> the Virgin was clad in vesture of royal magnificence and adornment, uh, as was befitting the king's daughter, the bride of God. So this is sort of a reference in the book of Psalms that's applied to the Virgin Mary. Following them were many kinsmen and friends, all with lighted tapers. Fifteen steps led up to the temple. Joachim and Anna lifted the Virgin onto the first step. Then she ran quickly to the top herself, where she was met by the high priest Zacharias, who was to be the father of St. John the Forerunner. Taking her by the hand, he led her not only into the temple, but into the Holy of Holies, the holiest of holy places, into which no one but the high priest ever entered, and only once each year at that. Saint Theophilact of Okrit says that Zacharias, quote, was outside himself and possessed by God when he led the virgin into the holiest place in the temple, beyond the second curtain. Otherwise, his action could not be explained. Mary's parents then offered sacrifice to God according to the law, received the priest's blessing, and returned home. The Most Her Holy Virgin remained in the temple and dwelt there for nine full years, so until she was twelve. While her parents were alive, they visited her often, especially the righteous Anna. Uh, when God called her parents from this world, the Most Holy Virgin was left an orphan and did not wish to leave the temple until death or to enter into marriage. Uh, as that would have been against the law and the custom of Israel, meaning to not get married. Uh, she was given to St. Joseph, her kinsman in Nazareth, after reaching the age of 12. Uh, under the acceptable role of one betrothed, uh, she could live in virginity and thus fulfill her desire and formally satisfy the law, meaning she appeared to be married. For it was then unknown in Israel for maidens to vow virginity to the end of their lives. The Most Holy Virgin Mary was the first of such life-vowed virgins uh, of the thousands and thousands of virgin men and women who would follow her in the Church of Christ. So that's a little backstory. Oh, you just got here, Stella. Well, if you want this for future reading, you can look at it. Thank you. So um, that's, that's the story broadly. That's basically a kind of the quick summary, the cliff note, as it were, uh, of it. So let's just kind of look at it a little bit. First of all, you know, it's, it's useful to understand the temple itself. Let me actually jump ahead a couple slides. So these are actually both the same thing. I pulled them off the internet, but they have different things they show, so it's easier to kind of look at it. So this is, these are both the exact same. It's just the same thing twice. Um, here's the Holy of Holies, which you can see also here. This is the holy place. So this was, this was, these are separate areas. The Holy of Holies was a, a, up a few steps from the Holies. And this was only entered into once a year by the high priest to offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people and for himself. Uh, then outside of that was the holy place. And then in the back here, you can kind of see, was the priest's court, which is basically here. Some of it, as I said, it's not all marked. Um, which is where the priests sort of did their work and offered the sacrifices people would bring you know, the things they wanted sacrificed, and the priest would do that here. You can even see here uh, a ramp. There was an altar here where the sacrifices were offered. There was a laver, which is basically a, you know, a, wa a place to wash yourself. So there was a washing basin here. Um, and then just in front of that was, you see it's marked differently, the court of Is the Israelites. So this is basically where, this was as far as non-priestly men who were Jews could go. So there was, there was sort of this continue, there was like this, you know, so, and maybe I'll go in the opposite direction. So, let me, let me flip it. So, this here is the court of the Gentiles. So, if someone was a pagan and was not, was not circumcised, ultimately, um, they were only allowed to be in this little peripheral court area, which is here, I don't think it's marked on this one. Um, then you enter through the beautiful gates into the court of the women. So this was for Jewish women could enter into here, but this is as far as they could go. Um, Jewish men who were not priests could go into the court of the Israelites, which is right in here. Um, and then the next area was sort of where all the priests would do their work. And then you had the holies, and then you had the holy of holies. Does that make sense? And again, so the holy of holies was a place that was only entered into literally once a year by the high priest to offer a sacrifice. It was it was the most sort of guarded 
place in the temple. So let's go back. So outside was the forecourt of the Gentiles. We talked about that. That was the part at the bottom. Uh, from there, a finely decorated gate called the Beautiful Gate led into the court of the women. So that's the Beautiful Gate, the court of the women, uh, uh, where women could enter. After that came the court of the male Israelites. We saw that. And through a gate was the court of the priests, which the priests entered to perform the rituals, meaning, you know, basically sacrificing the goats and the oxen and everything they sacrificed. Um, in it, so now in the, in the priest's court, in it stood the altar where the sacrifices were performed and a laver for ritual purifications, for washing themselves. At uh, the top of a flight of steps known as the ascent, uh, the anavatni, was the holy place which contained the table of the showbread, the seven-branched candlestick, and the altar of incense. So these are all things that were part of the Jewish worship. Um, at the highest point, up another flight of steps, was the Holy of Holies where, as mentioned earlier, the high priest entered once a year. So that's just so we have some sort of visual, geographic understanding of what's going on here. Um, so these are very similar icons. I thought it would be good to look at an icon. So these are icons of the feast day. Uh, it says here the presentation of the Most Holy Theotokos. Iento um, nao. Isodos, Pisteotoku, so the entrance, the going into the temple of the Virgin Mary. And here you see uh, the high priest Zacharias, right? And here as well, kind of slightly different versions. Uh, the Virgin Mary, kind of going up, we had mentioned in the story that there were these 15 steps, right? So she, here she's already up, and here she's sort of making her way up. Uh, Joachim and Anna are there with her. Um, uh, the, it mentioned in the story that there were the virgins that were escorting her with the candles, so you see them depicted here. Um, here, these people look older, so I'm guessing maybe these are the relatives that had come to escort her. It's kind of hard to tell. Also, something you see in the back of the portrait, and it, it didn't mention it in, in the story, but tradition has it that um, she lived in the Holy of Holies, and she was fed by an angel. That's basically how she was taken care of. So here you see the Virgin Mary, sort of in the Holy of Holies, and you see in both, both renditions, you see an angel sort of bringing her, sort of it looks like a, like a roll of bread or something like that. So these are just sort of different depictions of, of this event. Um, so um, what does the feast say about itself? So, and I've mentioned this before, the word synaxadion. So, Every day, liturgically, there's a liturgical book that's called the Meneon, and if you open it up and you go to today, you know, the 9th of, of December, you, you're going to see a synaxion which lists all of the things that are commemorated on the 9th of December. So, for in fact, we had liturgy this morning for uh, the conception of the Virgin Mary, so that would be one of the things listed there. So, um, for this particular feast day, it says, the synaxion of the feast refers to Mary's entry into the Holy of Holies, but it gives a theological interpretation. It says that the priests led her, quote, into the innermost part of the temple where, quote, it was appointed that the priests should enter once uh, a year. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year, quote, for the amendment and salvation of all. Mary was there for 12 whole years, spending that time alone. Uh, she stayed on her own in the Holy of Holies for 12 years until the Divine Annunciation. So tradition tells us again that, that when she turned 12, basically what happened was in the, in the Jewish faith, when, when a woman gets her, her, starts getting, becomes a woman, right, and has her period, she's no longer queen. And so she wasn't, when, when, when Mary became a, a mature female, she, she basically had to leave the temple because of that. And so in order to kind of keep her safe and keep her, to allow her to live the life that she had been dedicated to, she was betrothed to Joseph. Um, so that's sort of the backstory. Um, remaining in this inapproachable place, she made it her dwelling and abode, being accounted, we're talking about the Holy of Holies now. She made it her dwelling and abode, being accounted worthy of divine manifestation. And she was nourished strangely and continuously with heavenly food by an angel who served her in this mission. So this is kind of the, the story of, of this event. Um, on the Holy of Holies. So the Holy of Holies was a forbidden place because it was uh, awaiting the entry of the Virgin Mary, who became God's real temple and gave it greater honor. So 
One of the things that I was reading when I was preparing for this was, it was an interesting image, and that's that, that the Holy of Holies, basically even more broadly the temple in Jerusalem, was really just a prefigurement of the coming of the Virgin Mary. I don't know if you ever heard that or not. We talk about that a lot, right? I mean, we talk about how when, when you know, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, right? That was a prefigurement in some sense of uh, God sending his son to be a sacrifice, right? So, so the fathers of the church see in, in the temple itself, right, in the sanctity of the temple and the, and the, and the sort of limited access to the temple, right, that, that this was the place where God dwelt. Well, that's what the Jews believed. They believed that, that was, the temple was uniquely God's dwelling place. <clears throat> and we, what, we, what the fathers say, the saints say, is that that was purely a prefigurement of the coming of the Virgin Mary, who would truly, 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 truly be physically the temple of, of God, right? And carry within her womb man who is God. Um, the Virgin was not honored by that inaccessible place. Oh, this is great. The Virgin was not honored by that inaccessible place. She wasn't honored by going into the Holy of Holies, but it was the opposite. But the place was honored by the entrance of the Virgin, who was to become Christ's mother, right? So we think, wow, how and she was honored being able to go to the Holy Spirit. But the opposite is what the Fathers say. The saints say that, and indeed, the temple was honored by the presence of the Virgin Mary in it. Um, so what is the core of the celebration? So what is really being celebrated here? What, what is it? And I, I would say, this is from a quote, so the language is a little weird. And I would say that if you read the service, and if you read the three Old Testament readings at the vigil at Vesper, so if you, the night before the liturgy, there's a, there would be a vigil, and there's, there's Old Testament readings that are prescribed to be read. Um, you read all the canons, and pray all the canons, and sing all the hymns, and hear what is said, and listen to the scripture readings. What is being said here, and what is being contemplated in the person of Mary as the central character in the story, is that human beings are created by God and redeemed by God in Christ and sanctified by God through Christ by the Holy Spirit to become living temples of God himself. So one, one image that I, I, I think it was Saint um, Simeon, the new theologian, he, he, he says that there's only one Theotokos, there's only one Virgin Mary, but I don't know if you guys know, the word Theotokos, do you guys know what the word Theotokos means? Raise your hand if you know. You don't even, I, don't, I, I won't even ask you. Oh, wow, it's a word we use all the time. Well, you know it's a reference to the Virgin Mary, right? Raise your hand if you know that. Okay. So one of the code words, and we have lots of code words for the Virgin Mary, one of the words we use is the Theotokos. Theotokos literally means bearer of God. Theos, Theotokos. Theos is God, so God Tokos basically is ancient Greek. My ancient Greek ain't that good, so I can't parse it for you. But it, it means God-bearer, literally. That's literally the etymology of the word Theotokos is God-bearer, just so you know. Um, so St. Saint, Saint Thymian, the new theologian, says there's only one Theotokos, but we are all called to become Theotoki. That's the plural, right? So in the same way that the Virgin Mary literally held Christ, right? in her womb, we're all called to bear Christ within ourselves, right? So that's, that's, that's a significant, I mean, that's, that's our goal. And indeed, you could argue that we all do do that, right? Because we, when we receive Holy Communion, we have Christ in us, right? Certainly not in the way that the Virgin Mary did, but so that's, it's all about that. It's all about becoming Theotoki, right? Bearers ourselves of Christ. So, anyway. Um, so, um, the content of this feast is preeminently theological, which is kind of what I just said. Essentially, it describes not only the preparation of the suitable person, the Virgin Mary, so that Christ could become man, but also the manner in which every human being is deified, which is what we just said, right? That we all become Christ bearers, that we all, that we have one Theotokos, but we're all called to be Theotoki, which is the plural. Um, any questions on uh, comments, observations, confusion <laughs> needs to be clarified on that? We're going to move on to the next one. That's why. All right. No, let me ask yeah, Tom, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Zacharias was supposed to be the high priest? He was, and he, yeah, that's him right there. 
And he was, he would eventually become the father of St. John the Baptist. Right, and it, when he went into the temple, he lost his voice, is that it, right? Same one, yeah, it's in Luke. Wait, Luke, if you read Luke, he, yeah. Luke, wasn't Luke he tells that the, story. I thought he was, they had like a lottery of who could go in once a year. And that is in fact what would happen, okay. is um, they would have, so, so, I don't want to go too far afield, yeah, but, okay. no, 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 it's okay. So, you know, um, Jacob had 12 sons, right? And those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. So there was Levi and Benjamin, Jacob, or uh, Judah and Joseph, and I can't remember them all, but each one of them became a tribe. Um, Levi, who was one of the sons of uh, Jacob, uh, eventually had like a great great grandson who was Aaron. And so all the progeny of Aaron, Aaron was the first priest, and all of his progeny were the priestly families. So if your great 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 grandfather was Aaron, then you would be able to go and serve as a priest in the temple. And there was a rotation. Okay. And, and then whoever was there for that rotation, I think the, I, the, actually no, I think the high priest, you know, I'm not sure how the high priest was chosen actually. That I don't know. I, I could find that out, but I, that I, I don't readily know. So, any other questions? All right. So now we're gonna talk about the nativity, which is as we commonly know as Christmas. Um, we're gonna do a little quick reading here. So why don't we, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, there you go. All right. This is again, just sort of a quick, you know, cliff note explanation of the feast. This is a feast that hopefully we all know what happens on this one. Um, does everybody have, I think the back row is still, it's coming at you. Did you have a question, Hara? Yeah. He was the one who received her. Yeah. Correct. It's the same time when Zachariah got the news that it's going to be a father. I think that was a separate, you know, I don't know what the overlap was of that. I'm going to guess that it must have been a good bit later, only because um, John the Baptist was just a few years older than Jesus. And if Panayia was three when she was taken to the temple, it must have happened later. But I don't know. I don't think it was two years, was it? No. No. It had to be around the same age because when because Mary went to the, 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 the baby they were in the same. Oh yeah. Place. Okay, you're right. You throw it even closer. Yeah. So yeah, but it couldn't have been. It couldn't have been in that. It couldn't have been that case. Yeah, because that wouldn't have been possible if she was three. So it must have been a different time when he was serving as the high priest, and he. Okay, one more question. Real quick. Say that again. The only reason I don't think it happened that way, though, is because it, it doesn't, the timeline doesn't work. Because, because Zechariah, if you go back, hold on, let's go back. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. So Zechariah would have been, when he, when he received the Virgin Mary into the temple, she was three. Now, St. John the Baptist had to be at least 15 years younger than the Virgin Mary. Right? So there's no way that he went home to find that his wife was pregnant. It doesn't work. Yeah, Jonathan? But he was mute for some time, right? Until He was. Until That's what Luke says. Pregnant, or was that at when she became pregnant? No, it was during the pregnancy. Okay. It was during you know, I mean, it doesn't really indicate. I mean, he could have been mute for 15 years, but I don't know. It certainly doesn't indicate that in the scriptures. The service of the high priest was a cyclical thing. And I don't remember all the details. So it was a cyclical thing. So at that time, so like you said, but it was probably about 13 to 15 when she became pregnant. Yeah. So somewhere right around that time, Zachariah was again in service of the temple. Okay, so that would make, that's, what, which yeah, is what I'm... He was just serving in a 
another cycle. Yeah, okay. And can I just interrupt one more time? I just want to interrupt. Is, is Zacharias actually an uncle of hers then? So I think, yeah, I think Zacharias, yeah, well, it, there has to be some connection because John the Baptist is, I think, first cousins with right. Jesus Christ. But I'm not sure if it's like it's eternal. Is it mother and mother? Okay, so Zacharias' wife, Elizabeth. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Elizabeth and the Virgin Mary were sisters? Is that what we're? Cousins. Oh, so I guess they were second cousins then. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I'm being taught. So the nativity of our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read through this real quick. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son... Uh, to save the human race. And when nine months were fulfilled from the Annunciation, when the Archangel Gabriel had appeared to the Most Holy Virgin in Nazareth, saying, Rejoice, thou that art highly favored. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. At that time there went forth a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the people of the Roman Empire should be taxed. In accordance with his decree, everyone had to go to his own town and be registered. That is why the righteous Joseph came with the Most Holy Virgin to Bethlehem, the city of David, for they were both of the royal lineage of David. Since many people descended on the small town for the census, Joseph and Mary were unable to find lodging in any house, and they sought shelter in a cave which shepherds used as a sheepfold. In this cave, on the night between Saturday and Sunday on the 25th of December, the Most Holy Virgin gave birth to the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ giving birth to him without pain, just as he was conceived without sin by the Holy Spirit and not by man. She herself wrapped him in swaddling clothes, worshipped him as God, and laid him in a manger. Then the righteous Joseph drew near and worshipped him as the divine fruit of the virgin's womb. Then the shepherds came in from the fields, directed by an angel of God, and worshipped him as the Messiah and Savior. The shepherds heard a multitude of God's angels singing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. At that time, three wise men arrived from the east, led by a wondrous star, bearing their gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, they worshipped him as the king of kings and offered him their gift. Thus entered the world he whose coming was foretold by the prophets and who was born in the same manner in which it had been prophesied of a most holy virgin in the town of Bethlehem, of the lineage of David, according to the flesh, at the time when there was no king in Jerusalem of the lineage of Judah, but rather when Herod, a foreigner, was reigning. After many types and prefigures, messengers and heralds, prophets and righteous men, wise men and kings, finally he appeared, the Lord of the world and King of kings, to perform the work of the salvation of mankind, which could not be performed by his servants. To him be eternal glory and praise. Amen. Any comments or questions on that? All right. So, um, the four, so basically this story is only told in the Gospels. Right? So the Gospels, I don't, I don't want to assume anything. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. There's 27 books in the New Testament, starting with Matthew, ending with the book of Revelation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are called Gospels, and they are exclusively telling, telling us about the life of Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are stylistically very different than John, but all four of them are considered Gospels. Um, Acts is similar. It's a narrative. It's a story. But it, it takes place after Christ descends into heaven. And then all the rest of the uh, books are letters or other types of writing. So there's really only two Gospels in which we hear about the birth of Christ, uh, Luke and Matthew. Um, and each one has sort of a different story. So in Luke's story, we have Mary and Joseph, of course. Uh, we have the census, right, in Bethlehem. So they have to go. She's pregnant. And then she gives birth in a manger. And then we have the shepherds and the angels. So the shepherds and the angels appear in, in Luke's recounting of the birth of Christ. Uh, Matthew's story, is a, there's a few more parts. There's a little bit more moving parts in Matthew's story. Uh, Mary is pregnant. We hear all about sort of she was found pregnant. She hadn't been with a or she hadn't been with Joseph, and so he resolved to divorce her quietly. But then he has there's all these different instances. There's three instances where Joseph is going to do something, but then in a dream he's informed not to do it. So he was going to divorce the Virgin Mary, and an angel appeared in a dream and said, "Don't do that." He was going to go back to uh, to Nazareth, and, or he was going to go back to. 
wait a minute, he was going to go back to Nazareth. No, he was going to go back to where he was going to go back to, and he was told not to, and then he was going to go somewhere else, and then he was told not to do that. So jo it's great because, I, you know, I think Joseph is totally, we're going to read about him in a minute, he's a totally unsung hero of this story. I, I'm a big fan of Joseph. Anyway, we'll get into that. Uh, the wise men and the star, right, who come with the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Um, Herod wanting to kill the child, right? So the, the, we know the wise men go, first they go to Jerusalem. Uh, for some reason, they, in, you know, there's a star and it guides them to Jerusalem and they ask, uh, and they meet Herod and Herod tries to find out what's going on because he's kind of a paranoid king and he wants to kill any potential usurpers. So, and then finally, uh, the, the wise men come, they leave. Uh, Joseph is informed again in a dream to get out of there because Herod's going to try to kill the child, and they escape into Egypt. And that's kind of the end of that story, as it were. So that's just a little overview. But there are sort of two narratives. So if you really want to read the fullness of the Christmas story, you really need to read both Luke's story and Matthew's story. Um, so the first question I want to ask is, why, we're talking about Christmas, the nativity, right? Why did the God-man enter creation in this way, right? Or I guess, to put it differently, why didn't he, why wasn't he born the son of Caesar Augustus, right? And why didn't a star appear above Rome, above the palace of the emperor of the Roman Empire, right? Why, right? I mean, it's kind of a good question. People ask, why, why, why? So let's, let's address that question. Um, proud, rich men, and proud scholars, so just for the record, what he means is Herod and the Jewish leaders. Because you're going you're to realize, you know, the announcement of the birth of Christ was given to pagans, right? The wise men, they were pagans. They, were, they lived in far away. They weren't Jews. They weren't circumcised. They weren't God's chosen people. So the pagans get announced. The, the, the news, and the shepherds, who were basically these illiterate poor men who were Jews, but they were nobody. I mean, they, the, I'm sure the Pharisees and the scribes kind of looked down their noses at these little dumb, illiterate shepherds, right? But they're the ones who get the message, right? Not Herod and not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So anyway, proud rich men and proud scholars represent, fortunately, a minority of men, as there are more poor men in the world than rich and more poor in spirit than proudly learned. Therefore, it can be said that the proud and rich men of Rome and the proud scribes of Jerusalem represent a minority, while the poor shepherds of Bethlehem and the astrologers from the east with their longing for the truth represent a majority of men uh, at the time of the birth of Christ. These are the poor in spirit, uh, the best recruits for Christ's kingdom. And the others are those for whom it is harder to enter into this kingdom than for a camel to pass through the needle's eye, meaning the rich, you know, the, the Pharisees and the Herods and that. The Roman Caesar on the one hand and the Bethlehem shepherds on the other present a contrast in earthly power, wealth, and greatness, right? So it's, it is interesting. I think it's noteworthy, and we often see it when we read about the commentaries that it, the people that got the message were like the wrong people. You know, like if someone was reading this script and like how it was going to play out, they'd be like, wait a minute, you got all the actors wrong in this play. Everything's wrong. It's not right. But that's what happened. Right? So which tells us, of course, that, you know, God loves the simple, right? The illiterate, the, 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 the humble, the meek. And he, he loves those, even those who aren't of his people, like the, 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 uh, the Magi. He loves those who are seeking him. Because that's really what it was. I mean, the, the wise men were, were hungry to find truth, right? And God said, you know what? I'm going to reveal it to them. Um, Herod and, Jerusa and the Jerusalem scribes... Wait. Yeah. Herod and the Jerusalem scribes on one hand, uh, and the Eastern astrologers on the other, present a contrast in the possession of real truth, right? So the, the scholars... They had truth, but it was warped. You know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was knowledge for the sake of pride. It was knowledge for the sake of sort of hubris and thinking that one is, is better than another, right? But, but that wasn't the case with, with the astrologers, the magi. Uh, the knowledge of the true God. The Lord found it right to choose the poor and the pagans and through them to put the great and the proud to shame. 
Um, another kind of theme in, in the, the, the nativity story is this notion of um, Adam's disobedience and pride, right? Because that's what we see in the Garden of Eden, right? Adam was, was obviously disobedient. He took something he wasn't supposed to take. Uh, and he did that, uh, he was motivated to do that by his own pride, right? Um, contrasted with sort of Christ and really the whole story, all the main characters, the, the, the obedience and the humility of all these people, right? So the Lord Jesus showed humble filial obedience in deciding to be born as a man in the flesh. Uh, for the humiliated body of man was to him a cave even more humiliating than that of Bethlehem. So that's kind of a tricky line, but what he's saying is that for him to descend and become human, just taking on flesh was, was a, a more substantial condescension than for you and I to go into some dirty cave. Because he went from heaven, right? I mean, the angels and the glory and the megaloprepia and all these great things in heaven. To go from that to this is like to go from like a palace to a dung heap, is kind of what he's saying. So, so the contrast of going from heaven to just becoming a human is much, much greater, what he's saying, than, than, than being in this cave might be for a human, as it were. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Furthermore, he showed his humble obedience by being born in poverty with none of the necessities of life into a little-known nation, Israel, in an even less-known village, Bethlehem, and of a mother completely unknown to the world. The new Adam had to heal the old Adam of disobedience and pride. The medicine was obedience and humility. This is why the Lord did not appear to the world from proud Rome, but from Bethlehem, and not from the self-proclaimed divine house of August, Augustus, meaning the emperor, but from the repentant and humble house of David. And so this is kind of the point, is that to heal Adam's disobedience, Christ was obedient. To heal Adam's pride, Christ was humble. Uh, look now at the Lord Christ. Uh, this is a great passage. Look now at the Lord Christ. All is, now he's talking about the nativity, right? The birth of Christ. So kind of envision that story that we're talking about. All is obedience and humility. The archangel Gabriel, the representative of angelic obedience and humility. The Virgin Mary, obedience and humility. Joseph, obedience and humility. The shepherds, obedience and humility. The wise men from the east, obedience and humility. Storms, obedient. Winds, obedient. Sun and moon, obedient. Men, obedient. Beasts, obedient. The grave itself, obedient. Wow. All is obedient to the Son of God, the new Adam, and all is humble before him. For he also is unconditionally obedient to his Father and is humble before him. So this is the story, I and mean, this is what this is about. The star. So I'm going to just take a few minutes and talk about some of the different characters that we hear in the story. So we'll start with the star. The Holy Fathers thought in their wisdom that this guiding star that led the astrologers from the east to Bethlehem was not a star like other stars, but was some spiritual power in the form of a star. If the Lord could appear to Moses, and now he uses some Old Testament images, if the Lord could appear to Moses, the shepherd, as a burning bush, and to Abraham as three young men, we know the story, um, and to the prophet Elias as a whirlwind and a voice, why should the Lord or his angel not appear to the astrologers as a star? Oops. In his mercy, he comes down to men and appears to them in that form in which men most expect him. So he knew that these guys were watching the skies for signs of something, something greater, some truth or whatever. So he said, oh, well, they're watching the stars. Let me appear to them as a star. Right? Um, he appeared to the astrologers who had sought him among the stars as a star. But it was not his good pleasure to appear to the Israelites as a star, for they had never sought him in the stars. Kind of makes sense. Uh, St. Joseph the betrothed, right, who I, who I love. Um, to go back to Joseph, he with fear and trembling, saw more and more clearly that a tapestry was being woven around him, more penetrating than the sun's light and more all-embracing than the air. 
a tapestry of which the canvas is the Almighty and the angels and all creation, the silken strands. It fell to his lot to serve as God's instrument in the new, uh, in the center of the tapestry of the new creation. So what he's saying is that God had this role in mind for Joseph, and Joseph, you know, did it. Here we have Joseph kind of with the Virgin Mary. Um, while a man is unaware that God acts through him, he is weak and feeble, hesitant and cautious. But when a man senses that God has taken him into his hands, as a blacksmith takes iron to make a shoe, he feels at the same time both strong and humble, decisive in his actions and upheld by his God. So that's kind of the story of Joseph. Um, now the wise men from the east. In addition to the shepherds, the magi, or wise men from the east, were granted to worship the newborn Christ. The important thing is not when this happened. So there's, there's some discussion. Some people say that, he, that, that the star appeared maybe six, seven, eight months prior to Christ's birth so that they could actually get there on time. Others say that it appeared when he was born, and they actually arrived after he was maybe a year old or something. So that's what he's saying. Um, the important thing is not when this happened, but that they discovered Christ. Essentially, God was revealed to them, a thing which did, uh, did not happen to the scribes and the Pharisees, we talked about that before, who were the religious establishment of that time. Um, and then the shepherds. According to the fathers, this happened uh, for many reasons. Oh, so the question is, why did God appear to these simple shepherds? That's the question. Uh, first, because of the purity of the shepherds by reason of their solitude and hesikia, meaning probably these were men who lived solitary lives, and quite possibly the, what he's saying is they lived lives of prayer. They lived lives of sort of simple devotion to God, right? And what a better life, right? I mean, you think about how, how much, how conducive, you know, just a simple pastoral life would be to praying. And actually, look at all the Old Testament characters, right? Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd, right? All these great men were shepherds, so it's interesting. Um, even Joseph uh, was a shepherd. Secondly, because the shepherds were imitators and followers of the way of life and the virtues of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. That is to say, the shepherds were not chance characters. Thirdly, uh, for it to be shown that Christ will be the true shepherd of the, Israel, uh, of the Israelite and Gentile people. Fourthly, for it to be seen clearly that Christ chose the most simple-hearted and most capable of receiving this revelation, and not the crafty scribes and the Pharisees, again. All these things show the method that one can use to experience the mystery of the revelation. Right, so again, I think just to kind of back up, these two groups, right, that God reveals himself to, right, the, the, the magi, the wise men, the kings, whatever you want to call them, and the shepherds, represents sort of two sort of aspirations that we should have, right? One is, is to be hungry to know the truth, right? Because the hungrier, when we're hungry to know the truth, God reveals himself to us. That's the magic, right? And just simplicity of life, right? I mean, complex, we live in a very complex time, and I think it's more neuroses than it is complexity. I mean, we, 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 we style ourselves as being sort of sophisticated, but I think our sophistication is really not sophistication at all. It's just insanity. So, um, anyway. The angels, right? So we have um, these angels who appeared. This is a reference to the angels that appeared to the shepherds, right? So the shepherds are out taking care of their sheep, and all of a sudden we read in, is it, it's in Luke, um, that these angels appeared and said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill among men. Right? So this is who we're talking about. So the angel's hymn is also characteristic. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Um, the peace which the angels praised was not a social peace. So it wasn't like a political peace, is what he said. The absence of war, but the incarnation of the presence of Christ. So what he's saying is that when you and I think of peace, sort of our, our gut reaction is to think of sort of the absence of conflict, right? But that's not what he's talking about. The angels weren't announcing sort of this political peace or this lack of war or somehow Christ was going to usher in this global peacekeeping thingamabob. 
What, what he's talking about is a peace that Christ gives to those who follow him. But it's a different type of peace. Thus the angels were hymning the peace which came with the birth of Christ and not a peace that would come in the future. For by his incarnation, Christ gave man peace with God, right? So the first peace is that we are reconciled with God, right? We had been divided from God, right? When Adam and Eve disobeyed, there was a, a, a rift between God and man. So the first peace that we have is we have peace between ourselves and God, and that's ultimately achieved in the person of Jesus Christ, who is God and man himself, right? He is, he is that peace. He literally is that peace within himself. Um, his neighbor and himself as well. So God, Christ gives us the peace with God, with neighbor, and with ourselves, precisely because the divine nature was united with the human nature in his person, which is what I just said. After the fall, man lost peace with God because he worshiped idols without souls and senses and not the true God. Now by the incarnation, man is given the possibility to worship the true God. All right, so peace. He also attained peace with the angels and with his fellow men. And indeed the powers of his soul attained peace because Christ did what Adam failed to do. Adam had to attain full communion with God by the grace of God and his own personal struggle. The powers of his soul had to function naturally and supernaturally. This was achieved in Christ. So basically what he's saying is that what Adam and Eve did, which was basically create enmity between God and man, right? Between, uh, uh, by their disobedience, they, 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 Best way to phrase it. They, they, I was going to say messed everything up, but that's pretty bad. <laughs> um, but they, they created this rift. They, they created a, a, an inability. I mean, I guess one of, and we talked about this before, I think. It, it, when we talk about the, you know, the original sin, which really isn't the term we use, but what we really are talking about is this reality that we now live in, in which um, it is much, much more difficult to see God. It's much easier. We, we tend to, you know, we gravitate to sin rather than gravitating to virtue. In the Garden of Eden, before the fall, it was the opposite. Adam and Eve saw God and they, and they rejoiced in that. Now we do the opposite. We, we, we rejoice in evil, really. Right? So that's really what, that's what Adam had done and that's what Christ undid through his obedience and humility, which we talked about earlier. Um, all creation glorifies the birth of Christ. So, one of the things, I should have put it up here, I didn't, but one of the hymns in Christmas talks about how everything offers a gift. All of creation offers something to God. So not just humanity, but even the, the, the sky offers a star, the earth offers a cave, right? All of these things. Um, so also present at the birth of Christ was the creation which received grace from the Son and Word of God made man. The term creation comprises the animals, the cave, the manger, the mountains, the sky, etc. The icon of the birth of Christ shows that the whole creation receives grace from Christ. It's funny, do I have an icon? Oh, I think I have one. Yeah, you can see here, I mean, you know, even the animals, you see the angels, the star, the shepherds, the wise men, or you can kind of see part of one's face here. So this is what he's talking about, that all of creation is sort of offering something to God. Um, by the way, do you, does anyone know, what were the, what were the gifts that the wise men gave um, to Christ when they came? Do you remember? You know this one. Myrrh, yeah. frankincense, and gold. and gold. And you know, I've kind of heard two stories. Do you know why those three things were given? I mean, this is sort of the theological understanding of why they were given, at least. The gold, because he was king. Gold, okay. So, 
when you pay taxes, at least in, in that time, when you would pay taxes, you would pay it in, in hard metals, right? Like real metals, whatever you call them. So yes, yeah, so they gave him gold because he was the king of kings, we could say, right? So that's right. What about myrrh and frankincense? So myrrh, do you have a thought? Yeah, so myrrh was actually an embalming substance. So when, when people w would die, in order to sort of postpone the decay of the body, they would cover them in myrrh. And this would sort of, I don't know what the term is for it, but it would, it would act as a retardant of, of the decay, whatever. What about frankincense? You're, you're two for two, Janet. Yeah. Well, what do we do with Frank? What do we do with incense? Frankincense, what do we do? It's an offering to God, right? So, so the gold, the, 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 again, the saints sort of say, they say the gold was offered to him as God. The frankincense was, or, I'm sorry, the gold was offered to him as king. The, gold, uh, the incense was offered at, to him as God. And the myrrh was offered because he was born to die, ultimately. And another, actually, just a very practical thing I once heard, which I thought was interesting, is that, so in the story, right, they are uh, living in, in, in Actually, I'm not sure where they lived before Bethlehem. I think they were in Nazareth. So they're in Nazareth, right? And then they go to Bethlehem for the census that's being taken, right? And they probably just packed, you know, I mean, obviously traveling was different then, but you know, they probably packed for, you know, maybe a week at most, right? And certainly they didn't bring all their belongings, right? But then when they get to Bethlehem, they find out that Herod wants to kill them and they need to get to Egypt immediately, right? So they don't have time to go back and get their things and get their whatever they need to get. So I've heard people say that the gold was also God's sort of providential way for them to have money so they could travel to Egypt. So it's kind of an interesting little thought as well. Um, oops, wait. Um, so just continuing on that last point of all creation glorifying. Um, at the center of the icon is Christ, who is the source of uncreated grace. And from him pours forth God's sanctifying and deifying energy. At the birth of Christ, the whole creation is extolling God, its maker. It is bearing witness that Christ as God is the maker of creation, and, that, uh, and the creation is his handiwork. And I think that is the last slide. So, any comments, questions, anything? Three, we got a rule. We got three question rooms. So, yeah, I, like I don't understand why they gave the the mirror, the mirror, because you said it was for like the body. And well, the I body. think it was more of a. Was uh, a it was thing? sort of a prophetic. Okay. Yes, I think it was sort so of was a. Was that retained for him? It was. It, it the giving of the mirror was was looking ahead to his crucifixion and burial. Kind of. So was that. Well, how do we I don't know, know that how it was. I mean, my guess, to be honest with you, my guess is they probably sold all of it so they could travel to Egypt. Yeah. Because it all had value. Yeah. So they probably did what they had to do. Because, yeah, I, I mean, you don't really need myrrh if you're trying to escape to Egypt. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Any other? Two more questions before I let you go. <laughs> anyone? Anyone? Right. John, you got one? Do you have a question or not? No? Okay. There's two years. We got a John and a Jonathan right back to back. Any other questions? Yes. What about that date? Is it real or Prometheus? So, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's really any way to know that. I think, um, I don't know about Christmas. Well, okay. Many of the dates, many of the dates that we celebrate for feasts, you know, like, I, I don't know which one, but many of them, um, that they were given that date because um, a temp some temple back 1,700 years ago was built by the emperor and it was dedicated on that day. And so they decided that that would be the day that they would celebrate that feast. Um, my understanding with Christmas is that, I, I, I didn't read this, I'm going back in the archives of my brain, but my understanding was that um, the pagans celebrated sort of the invincible sun on December 25th. And so when, when Constantine was sort of Christianizing the empire, he decided to sort of take over that date and kind of remove the pagan and make it a Christian event rather than a pagan event, which really actually, that's what Halloween is. I mean, I don't know if you know that, but Halloween is, is it was, that's not an Orthodox, it's more of a Western European, like Catholic, but Halloween was, was was 
um, it was like the Day of the Dead. And so they decided to take All Saints Day, All Hallows Day, Halloween. Well, actually, Halloween technically is the eve of All Saints Day. Um, and they tried to do that, but it obviously didn't work very well. Because <laughs> we still have Halloween. So, yeah, Eleni. So, like March but yeah, that wasn't uncommon, though, that they would do that as well. So like March 25th, the Annunciation, yeah. nine months after that, is December 25th. It is. Well, those are, those are cal some of those are calculated. Even the birth of the Virgin Mary, um, or even, even, well, no. So from the birth of Christ, uh, if you count eight days, you get the circumcision. January 1st is the circumcision, which is, that's when they would circumcise on the eighth day. And also, he was presented to the temple on the 40th day, which is February 2nd. So, so there is, those things work. Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, you can't, you can't be like, you can't be conceived and then be born two months later. Right. right? I, mean, that's yeah, I got the third question. Okay. Yeah. Well, this no, actually is no, the fourth. No disrespect, yeah. but uh, you showed a, a picture of uh, Joseph and Mary and the baby. Okay. Uh, I mean, an icon. And uh, yeah, if you go to it, a little disturbing to me because Joseph looks like a really old man, and Mary is probably this one. 13, 15. Well, he was. He was old. He had kids. He had grown kids. In fact, some of his kids were the disciples of Christ. He was, so there, I think he had already had a family. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I think tradition tells us he was a widower. And, um, but, but he was sort of willing to take the Virgin Mary as his betrothed, but really basically as his daughter for all intents and purposes. And they never, they never had, the church teaches, they never had, they never had physical right, relations. Right, absolutely. But yeah, but no, he was, uh, Quite a bit older. In fact, you know, after after the nativity scene, we never hear about Joseph again. Right. So he probably, you know, he certainly wasn't alive. It seems like he wasn't alive right. when Christ was out doing his ministry, and we don't know exactly when he died. But certainly, he was much older than the Virgin Mary. But that was intentional. I mean, I think it was that was thought out. Yeah, uh, Jen. I also heard that the swaddling clothes. People would die, so like Joseph carried what they would call the the clothes, the spot. They wrapped the bodies in. Them. Oh wow! So Christ was wrapped in the clothes of death. Well, and, and even here, like this icon, looks like that. Yeah. I mean, even his head is covered, which is yeah. kind of strange. Yeah. He's like mummified, but more the or less. Symbolism of that yeah. Is well, and even if you look. If you look at this, right, look at this manger. Yeah. This manger looks a lot like a, a, a tomb. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it, indeed, if you look at the icons, I don't have one handy, but if you look at the icons of the resurrection of Christ, uh, the, he, that's exactly what Christ is pulling Adam and Eve up out of. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so, yeah. The other thing, um, barn furniture is a trough, you know. For the sure. Animal. And that's what I always kind of picture, that Jesus was put in that trough. I've seen ones that looked more trough-like. This does not look trough-like at all. I've seen ones that looked like they were wood, and they legitimately looked like a trough. But, this, but oftentimes they don't, at least in Orthodox iconography. Like here, this one's kind of, you can see it looks like that, the same. Let's see. Yeah, this one the same. It looks really like, a, like, a, like where you put a dead body. Nico, you had a question or a comment? <clears throat> Some years ago, because of some debating I had last week when I in college, I looked up some things and I found out actually from some Judaic references to Christ that they point to the fact that Jesus was probably actually born around the time that he died. Because in Judaism, there was a thing that if you died on or about the date you were born, that that was a historical marker. Yeah, I've heard, I have heard that, I, not much of it, but I have heard that rings a bell. The other thing is that even now, historically, if you look back to the accounts of the Nativity, the only time if you go to Bethlehem, if you go for the Feast of the Nativity, there's no shepherds sitting on the hills tending their sheep. They're only there in the springtime. That's the only time of the year that they tend sheep oh. on the hills. So what were they doing there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, what they're doing is they're, they're grazing the sheep to end up taking them to Jerusalem for Pascha. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Didn't know that. Didn't know that. Yeah. 
Any other comments? Questions? You can, uh, well, let's, uh, you can, yeah, you can turn it off if you want. That's fine. Just hit the red button. And then we'll say a closing prayer.